197 sermon on uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. This is True Love Chapel talking about being stewards of God's grace and uh, especially important um, if you consider yourself a Christian. Uh, I think we need to pay attention to these words uh, that Peter wrote following the uh, reading plan here going through the Bible. We've just about completed the entire um, New Testament, new focuses on the New Testament, uh, you know, as the year comes to an end. And then we are going to start up again next year with a different translation of the Bible. We're in ESV uh, right now. Next year, I think, is New King James Version. So anyway, yeah, um, join us, get on that reading plan, go through the Bible, learn a lot. It's great. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for this uh, Bible study. Please bless this sermon. Please strengthen your church. Please uh, encourage your your children, Lord God, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. First Peter chapter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time is past, the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So, we are going to be focusing on these first five verses of First Peter chapter 4. And uh, just to get us thinking about um, what it means to be a Christian. Um because there are a lot of people who say they're Christians, but they they live no different from the world. So are they a Christian? Are they a hypocrite? Uh, what's going on here? And uh, what does it mean to really be a Christian? So that's some of the things I hope we can cover. But uh, so what's the world? Uh, what's the world up to is. Uh, the world is very interested in pleasure. They're interested in, um, you know, the f satisfying the flesh, the desires of the flesh, and the desire of that fleshly man, uh, the the sin nature that they were created with. So that involves the desire for wealth, power, um, influence, prestige, honor. Um, so they want to be puffed up with pride. They want they want people to to look up to them, to think highly of them. That's an important thing to the world. It's really important. And so, with a Christian, it's almost opposite. You know, we we need to somehow come to grips with the terms um, come to grips with the <laughs> the, the idea that uh, the world is not going to be accepting of our choices how we live our life they will um, speak evil of us for that and we have to just make this clean break from the world and be okay with that that we're not looking to the world for acceptance we need to learn how to look to god for acceptance and uh verse one since therefore christ suffered in the flesh Okay, stop right there. Um, we're followers of Christ. We're children of God. Um, those who accept that free gift of salvation that Jesus died on the cross. He suffered in the flesh. And uh, he did that to pay the price of our sins so that we simply receive that gift of eternal salvation by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. It is a gift that is received through faith in him. It is not earned. It is not deserved. Is simply received when we put our faith in Jesus Christ so <clears throat> now Jesus didn't have to die on the cross Jesus Christ is exalted above any other name he is God himself he is God incarnate 
the second person of the Trinity, the God, the Son, you know, remember God is uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, the Son is the one who created all things. He spoke and the universe leapt into existence. Um, the Word became flesh and lived and dwelt among us. So the fullness of deity in bodily form, that is Jesus Christ. Um, he didn't have to suffer. He's God. He has, he has um, you know, lived in this unspeakable glory for all, all eternity. And yet he chose to come and suffer. And, um, and he's doing it to teach us a lesson, really, to show us something to show us a pattern that we need to follow. Because, like I say, it's not that he needed to do it. He just chose to set things up that way so that <clears throat> so that the only way he could be um, just abounding in grace and mercy and judgment in equal parts was to take the punishment upon himself and uh, and just pattern himself, you know, as a example of, of being humble who, well, who could be what better example of being humble than that um, God Almighty becoming uh, someone who was mocked who was beaten who was killed and uh, so so if he can do it we can do it that's that's what I'm getting at God is showing this for our sake showing us this is what we need to do a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted him, they will persecute us also. That is a part of the Christian walk, the Christian life. Jesus said, um, no one can be his disciple unless they take up their cross and follow him. That means a complete commitment towards following him, even though uh, it involves suffering, it involves uh, a struggle, effort, you know, and it, and it involves the world looking down on you. Does anyone look up to the guy who's carrying a cross, who's all bloodied up, carrying this Roman uh, execution device down the street, ready to be killed? Um, everyone looks down on that person. Nobody wants to be that person. Um, Christ is saying, you need to be that person. And... Um, and the next part of the verse says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So this is a type of a victory. Um, this is how you get free from sin and, and victory in your life over all these, these sins and these lies of the devil that's holding you back. And to arm yourself, almost like a weapon, you arm yourself with the way of thinking that you want to be like Christ, you want to be um, looked down on by the world. You want to be mocked and persecuted for doing what's right. Because Christ lived that way, so you want to be that way. That's the level of commitment um, in the life of the true Christian, the spirit-filled Christian. And um, so it says right here, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So, you know, sin is a lot has a lot to do with being comfortable in the flesh. Um, but if you're willing to suffer in the flesh in order to not sin, you've you've achieved a great victory over sin, and then you can truly see um, sort of the truth of the situation that that joy that God has to offer, it is it is different from the happiness that the world offers. Because what, what does the world offer? I consider it happiness versus joy. Happiness is a state of contentment when things are going your way, when things are, you know, pleasing to you. Um, I'm happy. I have a good job. I have a home to live in. I have uh, you know, friends and family that care about me, whatever the case may be, you feel happy. You're happy with that. Okay. And, uh, but joy is something different. It's, it's a joy, um, 
that doesn't depend on outside circumstances. It's a joy where you could be beaten up and in prison, ready to be executed for your faith in God and be singing hymns and to be joyful in your heart because you have that that thing that was missing in the world is that connection with God. You have the Holy Spirit in you. So you have joy that comes from this fellowship with God. And um, and so it doesn't just depend on things going well for you. It's, it's ups and downs. When you're willing to suffer in the flesh for, for following Christ, you've made a great commitment and a great step. And I think a lot of... Uh, Christians, uh, I use the term loosely, uh, Christians nowadays, they never, probably they never get there. Um, they're just Christians in name only. They're not willing to suffer. They're not willing to give up anything. You know, they want everything for themselves rather than giving up all for Christ. So you got to watch out for that. Um, it's, it, it takes a clean break from the world. Um, you have to just decide enough is enough. It's not, you know, the time is, is over for that. Goes, verse 3 talks about that, but we'll get there. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. We want to cease from sin. Um, let me, I'm going to flip forward a to uh, 1 John, a couple pages over. And um, in chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. The purpose here is that we may not sin. God doesn't want us to sin. Sin is destructive. It's a horrible thing. And it says, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Christ died to pay the price of sins. And this is, um, you know, we're talking about people who sin by mistake, by accident, people who are grieved by their sin and want to repent and turn from it. People who are delighted and uh, filled with joy when they follow God's commandments. Um, that's a different thing. There's a few. There were a few other verses. I did not mark them out in notes. I'm just looking through. But it says, um, um, it says, oh, in chapter, or First John chapter one verse six. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Meaning, you cannot have fellowship with God and walk in darkness at the same time. Um. And there were many more. The chapter, First John chapter 2, verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And uh, so, yeah. Anyone who makes a practice of sin is from the devil. I was looking for that. That's also in here somewhere. But... I hope you get what I'm getting at here. <clears throat> so this idea of people who say that they are Christians, they say that they know God, they say that they know Jesus, they, you know, and at the same time, what? They never go to church. Some of them do, most of them don't. They spend every Friday and Saturday night out drinking, getting drunk. They never seem to miss that, do they? They miss church, but they never miss a night out in the bars. They sleep around, sexual immorality, they lie, they cheat, they steal, they do everything, they, they disobey all of God's commandments, and they don't care, and they turn around and call themselves Christians. These are the people I'm talking about. These are the people that are not real Christians at all, and um, I hope that they would, you know, that they would change, and that they would, you know, if they have even the faith as small as a mustard seed then they, they have hope but um, by their fruits you will know them so uh, if they're going to live like um, an enemy of God then we need to consider them as if they were an enemy of God 
um, in my opinion, because the scripture does also say, purge out the evil person from among you. I believe it's in 1 Corinthians. They were also struggling with people in the church who were living immoral lives, and they needed to be kicked out and say, you should not even eat with such a person. Um, don't act like it's okay. It's not okay. Um, if they were not a Christian, we have a little more leniency there because um, someone who doesn't know Christ, of course, we don't expect them to act like they know Christ, but someone who says that they know Christ has a responsibility to behave as a child of God. And if they're not, if they're in this willful, sinful disobedience, then they should be regarded as someone who is lost. And we don't want them to influence us in a negative way. I'm talking about Christians. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so it has ceased from sin. We're still in verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 4. And you cease from sin, it means you've stopped having sin to be the pattern of your life. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you never sin. But sin is no longer the pattern of your life. Um, God-like, um, Christ-like righteousness, uh, holy living, that is the pattern of your life. That's what gives you joy. And um, uh, like I say, if you slip up and made a mistake for the child of God. We have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside of us. So it makes us feel convicted if we if we mess up and we want to repent from that. And we do. We repent. We turn from it. We turn back to God. That's where we find our joy. Someone who doesn't know Christ has everything backwards in their mind. They're deceived by the devil. <clears throat> the devil tells them that they need to have these things to make themselves happy. They need to be drunk. Who, why are they getting drunk? Is fun? It can be fun, I guess, but um, they take it too far. Um, drinking is, uh, is actually a sin. Overindulgence and drunkenness is a sin, but um, it's it's kind of kills the pain. I think that's what it's looking for because... Uh, Without God in your life, there's there's a great emptiness and meaninglessness to, to your entire life. And that you just cannot cover up. But the devil tells you you need to try with alcohol, with drugs, with um, adulterous relationships, anything, any sin. He thinks that that's what's needed to make you, yourself happy. You just need more money. You just need more um, fame and power, whatever. It's all a lie. It's trying to say that you won't be happy without those things. It's trying to say that a Christian is, is a miserable person, like a killjoy. They just don't know how to have fun. That's such a lie. Such a lie. Uh, true, true happiness and joy is only found in Christ. Christ came that we would have life and that we would have it abundantly. <clears throat> so there you have that. Verse 2. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So our time is limited. We have to some have some point make a clean break. Um, you can't keep putting it off. At some point you have to say, you're going all in to follow Christ. If you are a true child of God, it requires 100% commitment. And someone who's willing to suffer in the flesh for the sake of Christ, as someone who can understand that they have been refined through the fire, and now they are <clears throat> something um, precious, something that God has made useful in His hands. And so that's where it talks about living out the rest of your life not for human passions, but for the will of God. So God has a plan for you, and He has a purpose for you. He's given you talents. He's given you. Um, time, talents, and ability to use for his purposes as soon as you can make yourself sort of an empty vessel in his hands and let him fill you. Um, 
God will do amazing work in you and through you. So we need to stop thinking just about ourselves. You know, this life will be over um, sooner or later anyway. You know, live out the rest of your life. Make the decision to be ultra committed to Christ and, um, and, and just to do something for the sake of God, for the sake of other people. People might get saved and have eternal life based off of something you may have played even a small part in. God is doing the work. We are just the, the vessels in his hands. And then verse 3 it says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. We all did those things or similar things like those in the past, and that's enough. That was enough. That was more than enough. We shouldn't have even done it then, but we did. Let it go. You don't need that stuff to be happy. Um, <clears throat> that will ruin your life. You have to make a clean break from that. And then and then there's that's the funny thing. When you make a clean break from that type of lifestyle, you're actually in you know in standing up for the Christian walk. Um, it, it's showing that you don't approve of that lifestyle. It's showing that it, you regard it as something wrong, something shameful. God sees it as shameful and wrong, so now we're going to see it and treat it as shameful and wrong. And the world doesn't like that, do they? They don't like that. And so with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. That is, they speak evil about you, okay? And they're, they are surprised. They, they don't understand. Well, that confusion is, can be a good thing because a few of them might end up becoming Christians usually because they see you the way you live is something different. You, you have to practice what you preach, in other words. It has to be real, uh, a reality in your life before you can teach it to others. And you have to show that it is something valuable, something worth, um, you know, if it's worth Christ dying for, it's worth you living for. And so the answer here, verse 5, but they will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. So yeah, leave that up to God. Um, God is the one we need to please, not the world around us. And uh, so, yeah, that's basically it. Um, not easy to do, but it's extremely important. That's why um, we're talking about it. That's why it's here in the scripture. It's important. And uh, you can't just gloss over this and then forget about it. This is something that you need to take it to heart. And it will shape the, the way you live the rest of your life. And the way you look at life. <clears throat> you just have to, you know, realize that a child of God is in the world, but we are not of the world. If we were of the world... The world would love us as its own. But since Christ called us out of the world, the world hates us. And that's what we're called to do. So <laughs> that's the thing. Now, why would we do that? Why? Because it's true. Because Christ died on the cross. Because the tomb is empty. Because the prophecies have been fulfilled. It's proven to be true. And... Uh, <laughs> and it is true and so we experience we get to experience that when you uh when you put your faith in jesus christ um submit your life to christ give your life to jesus christ um live out your life as a committed christian you're not going to be a halfway christian make the decision you're going to be the best christian you can be that you're going to be a uh, 
man or woman of God, that you are going to be in ministry, either as a job or as a um, just lifestyle that we do, something outside of our job. You know, <clears throat> ministry doesn't have to be a professional employment. All Christians are called to ministry. We're going to serve God, living out the rest of our time in the flesh for the will of God, even if it means we have to suffer, even if it means we have to be mocked and uh, persecuted. Okay, make that decision, and you'll be amazed at what God can do. Um, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> scripture says draw near to him and he will draw near to you it says that uh, he's not far from any one of us so he's God is waiting and looking for people who will make this type of commitment to him and he will respond <clears throat> he will lead you he will guide you he will fill you with the Holy Spirit he will reveal himself to you so that you will know him through experience not just know of him but know him directly. And um, that changes everything. So let's pray. Almighty God, help us to be true Christians. Help us to be um, committed to you, God. And uh, let us live out our lives for your will. Please let us not be satisfied with sin. Let us not be happy in sin. But please keep us far away from it. If we do make a mistake and we sin, please um, convict us. Let the Holy Spirit convict us and lead us away from that. Let us repent. And uh, just please reveal your, yourself in greater ways, increasing ways to your children to encourage us, strengthen us, and equip us for your good pleasure and your good work. And let us bring glory to you with our lives, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.